We're out here at our 360 Proving Ground site. We're at the Go Beyond 100 bushel soybean plot. Uh, and I want to give you a quick plot layout, uh, give you a little bit of information on what we did, why we did it. Uh, so as we walk through this plot, um, everyone's going to have a little bit of a background on what we see out here today. So what we've got here is we've got about three different treatments. So we've got plant date, which loops all together here on the north end. Uh, we've got some fertility studies, which are down towards the middle of the plot. And then down towards the south end, we've got population as well as row spacing. So we're going to kind of call that our sunlight session. So how can we capture more sunlight uh, with different populations as well as different row spacings? So for years, we've been trying to push corn yields, but we've been comfortable in the past with 50 or 60 or even 70 bushel beans. Um, but in recent years, with some of the advances in seed treatment uh, and different things of that nature, we've seen bean yields take the next step. And what we want to try to do with this plot is we want to try to look at the things that we can control that are going to take bean yields to that next level. And we believe what we've got out here are things you can do with, with minimal input costs and minimal change in practices and still achieve those high yielding beans. So what we've done is change the planting date. We have heard through studies through university and other trials that planting date makes a big difference on the ending bushels. What we've done here is we've set up five different planting dates starting at March 28th, ending with June 4th. The first thing you will notice is just the difference in growth from June 4th to March 28th. Along with that, there is a lot of difference in development stage along with pod count. Looking at these middle three rows, they are varying in dates from April 11th, April 23rd, and May 18th. You'll see there's very little difference between the middle three rows. We have to take into account the start that these plants got. It was cold, wet, rainy for the good part of April and May. So they kind of all acted very similar in the beginning. The other thing we also need to reference is on this March 28th planting, this actually was rained on, snowed on, ground was frozen, and still very little stand was lost. You want to trick the plant into thinking and going into reproduction while the days are still getting longer and the nights are still getting shorter. This will allow for reproduction to go on for a longer period of time, which will increase the number of nodes along with the number of pods set in the final. So as of last week, when we took our plot samples and figured yield, March planting currently stands about even with the April 11th planting also. But the key point is when we did our counts, we did not take in to affect the amount of blooms or the amount of pods that were beginning to grow. There was a substantial amount of pods and branching on that March 28th that we were not allowed to count. The April 11th and April 23rd planting dates had similar pod counts and similar yield estimates as of the day we took our counts. They also have a lot of blooms on them and a lot of pods yet to develop. The May 18th and June 4th planting dates we're way behind. Um, when we did our uh, initial yield of estimates for June 4th, it actually only was about a bushel an acre. The plant had just be gotten into reproduction at that point and just was flowering. So it is way too early to know or to have a good handle on where that will end up. But by looking at it now, you can see that there is a huge difference between the top and the bottom of the plot, which should transfer into final yield. It's gonna be hard for that June 4th planting to even come close to catching March 28th. So now that we've talked about plant date, we wanna look a little bit at how fertility impacts yield as well. So what we've got going on here is we've got two different planting dates. The first planting date is right here behind us. The next planting date is down at the south end of our plot. Now the spring we had up in central Illinois um, didn't allow us for much mineralization at all. So we know a soybean plant uses about four and a half pounds of nitrogen per bushel. We also know that it fixes most of that nitrogen itself. So we typically don't have to go in and apply any extra. That is assuming we've got yields at about 60 to 70 bushel. So anytime we get over 60 bushel to the acre, there's not enough nitrogen in the air and there's not enough nitrogen in the soil to supply that plant. So when we saw the advantage to three and a half gallon of starter in furrow, we attributed that back mostly to the nitrogen factor. That allows that plant to start fixing nitrogen a little bit earlier instead of V3, V4. And that allows us to stack those nodes on there a little bit tighter, as well as push that plant on a little bit further reproductively. So when we look at comparing the April 23rd check to the April 23rd plant date with the starter, what we wanted to look at 
is what is driving yield. So we can see we've got our check strip here. Uh, we don't have many pods. It's kind of a tall, lanky plant that doesn't have much plant mass. Then when we look at our starter pass, we've got a lot of branching, we've got larger pods, and we've actually got several more pods on this plant than the check strip. And that's where we're getting our eight bushel advantage here on starter at this point in the growing season. Now we want to talk a little bit about the sulfur component. Uh, when we started looking at research from throughout the industry, uh, Purdue did several studies and what they saw was they saw a huge advantage to adding sulfur to soybeans on sulfur deficient soils. Now we've come in with a wide drop pass and we've actually added about 12.2 gallon of thio in with, this, in with these soybeans. And what we see on this board here behind us, so we're actually at R4. So when that plant starts moving that nitrogen from that stover into the seed, we could potentially see a huge advantage in bean size and bean weight. We see a huge advantage to putting a little bit of starter fertilizer in furrow with a soybean to get it off to a good start and to help that plant start fixing nitrogen early. The third and fourth part of this trial, we're going to look at row spacing along with population. One of the things that we've talked about and one of the things you see in some of the high yield contests, is guys are starting to lower population and trying to increase the amount of bushiness or allow the plant to flex and create more beans versus putting more seed out on the ground. What we're trying to do is decrease the amount of inputs we're putting into the crop while maximizing the amount of ROI. What we've done is if you take into account $60 a unit for soybeans, for every 25,000 plants you lower population, that's roughly $10 an acre in savings. So what we've done here is we have an 80,000, a 140, and a 120 strip. The 140, the 120, and the 80. What you'll see at first glance is there is a lot more bushiness and a lot more branching going on in the 80. When we break it down and do pod counts, what we found is the 80 actually is competing, if not beating, the 120 in pod counts and weight. The 140 actually is behind just slightly. And when it comes to the 80,000, we understand that it has to be able to do that in order to keep up with the higher populations. The final goal is to maintain and maximize yield all while reducing inputs. The next thing we want to discuss is spacing. Within this plot, we are comparing 20 inch rows and 30 inch rows. The main advantage we've seen with 20 inch rows this far in the season is an increased can MP which allows for better water utilization and decreased weed pressure. And we can't forget within 30 inch rows, the increase in airflow and sunlight allows for less white mold pressure. So some of the things we learned in this plot, uh, we really like the advantages of being able to get those bean planters out early, especially when some of those conditions are a little bit tough for corn planting. Uh, we understand that we could potentially give up a little bit of stand count, getting those planters out in March or early April, but with some of the populations things we've seen uh, throughout this plot, we're willing to get those planters out early. We like the potential we see by being able to do that, even if it means giving up a little bit of population because those beans are gonna flex and make up for that lost population in pod count, number of nodes, and bean size. So along with being able to get those planters out early, we really like the advantage we saw with putting a little bit of starter in furrow and helping get that plant off to a good start. And as far as population goes, we've realized by doing this plot that we can afford to give up a little bit of stand count and still maintain our yield. With row spacing, we haven't seen a huge advantage one way or the other thus far, but we'll continue to monitor that throughout the season. All this was done in order to help you go beyond 100 bushel beans. So we're out here today six weeks later. We started to see some trends play out early in August. Uh, it was a little bit too early in the season to tell what that was going to mean yield-wise. Uh, so we're out here today reevaluating. So let's take a look and see what we found. So the layout we've got here, the very right plant uh, would be our March 28th plant date. To the left of that is our April 11th plant date. The center plant there is be April 23rd, and then May 18th, and then the far left would be our June 4th plant date. So you can see the first two, the April 11th and the March 28th, the pod set is significantly lower on those than the other three. And what that means is those plants actually flowered before that summer solstice. So uh, they set those pods lower. They were, they were able to get more stable later in the growing season when we got that heat, and they were able to keep more of those pods. That April 23rd plant date actually went through some pretty tough conditions from the standpoint of a wet spring. Uh, so to do pod counts, that one's actually lower than lower than our May 18th date. So 
Uh, you can see how far the nodes are apart on the last three, the left three. And what that means is those plants didn't get flowered before that summer solstice. Those nodes are further apart. We've got less pods per node, and that means less pods per plant. So those, those last three plants are a, are a lankier plant, a taller plant. Um, as we do pod counts out here today, it's, it's really looking like those earlier plant dates are starting to pull away from those later ones in terms of yield. Let's jump into plant population. We've got beans planted here on May 18th at 140,000 versus beans planted on May 18th at 80,000. When we pulled stand counts, these were actually pretty close to 140. Uh, we probably gave up a little bit of stand, um, but these actually dropped down about 67,000. So when we did pod counts here, we got about 103 average pods per plant on these, and we had 56 average pods per plant on these. So we've got to have about twice as many of these uh, to equal these in terms of yield when we start looking at stand counts. So the biggest difference you pick up between these is the branching. We've often relied on, on population to close those rows and get that, get that row shaded, but you can see what this bean is able to do uh, when it comes in terms of, of branching out and being able to close those rows and eliminate a lot of that weed pressure. So when we look at the 80,000 planted versus 140,000 planted, these are sure in the hunt compared to these. Uh, the trend has been going to lower population on soybeans, and so far what we've seen uh, we think there's really something to that. One of the big decisions we make when planting soybeans is what row spacing to put them in. And we've already talked about the advantages of a 20 inch row versus a 30 inch row when it comes to weed pressure and water utilization. Uh, but earlier in the season when we pulled these plants, we didn't see much of a difference between the two. And what we started to pick up here today is we, we've started to notice a lot more branching. So we've got about 20 more pods per plant here in the 20 inch row than we do here in the 30 inch row. Now, some of that could be a little bit of a reduced stand count from not having as much push power uh, in a narrow row, those seeds being further apart. But what you can see here is since we've got more branching, uh, we were able to capture that sunlight much better than we were in this 30 inch row. These beans were planted on April 23rd. Uh, we had several beans in the area and across the Midwest that were planted into June, uh, especially in a 30 inch row. That's a pretty common practice around here. Uh, means those were planted in a 30 inch row, planted late, that means a lot of those rows didn't get closed. So we, hit, we have had some pretty significant weed pressure late and being able to put those beans in a little bit narrower of a row uh, kind of helps mitigate that risk uh, as we start thinking about planting beans later in season. So we understand there are a lot of factors that go into choosing a row spacing. What we've tried to do in this plot is evaluate the factors that go into determining pod counts on these soybean plants. So a lot has certainly changed in this plot since six weeks ago when we did our first evaluation. And you can see some of those differences, especially in maturity, starting to show up behind me. Uh, we've also got things like uh, starter fertilizer applied in this plot. We've got some sulfur uh, applied in different strips as well. So as we move towards harvest, we'll continue to monitor these strips. Uh, we'll take these to yield and we'll let you know what we end up with here at the end of the season. So now that we've got our results back from our soybean trial at Proving Grounds, we want to take a minute and go over those with you today. So first we're going to talk about plant date. In this particular trial, we had five different plant dates. The first one was March 28th, second one was April 11th, third was April 23rd, fourth was May 18th, and the fifth was June 4th. As it relates to yield, the March 28th treatment had the highest yield at 102 bushel the acre. The April 11th yield was at 93 bushel the acre, April 23rd at 98 bushel to the acre. The May 18th yield was at 95 bushel to the acre, and the June 4th yield was actually at 90. So in terms of comparisons, the March 28th date beat the June 4th date by 11.5 bushel to the acre, it beat the May date by 6.7 bushel to the acre, and it beat the late April date by 4.2 bushel to the acre. So even though those early beans were under a lot of stress, since we were able to get them out there early, and get those beans tricked into flowering before that longest day of summer, we saw a huge yield advantage as opposed to planting those later in season after our corn. So we also did a check strip on the April 23rd plant date with a no starter pass compared to a pass with four gallon of a 1034-0 in furrow. The strip with 1034-0 in the furrow actually yielded five and a half bushels more. We fully realize that that's a pretty hot rate to be putting in furrow with the bean. So we're gonna test this in 2020 and see how it plays out this year. So in terms of our population trial, uh, we really compared two different dates. We compared the April 23rd date at 140,000, as well as that April 23rd date at 80,000. 
At the same time, we compared the May 18th date in the same form. So we did a May 18th plant date at 140,000 and a May 18th plant date at 80,000. Now, with the May 18th plant date, since we didn't have as much stress as the April 23rd plant date, the yield was very comparable. So we didn't see much of a difference between the two. So for the April 23rd plant date, the 140,000 population actually beat the 80,000 population by about five bushel. Reason for that is we gave up some stand on both of those because of the stress we saw in April, and we were able to push that 140,000 a little bit further than what we were with the 80,000. So when we talk about the May 18th plant date, at 80,000, we were able to grow the same amount of beans as we were at 140,000, but we were saving 60,000 beans per acre on our seed costs. It's definitely something to consider when you're looking into your plan for 2020. Next thing we compared with our April 23rd plant date and our May 18th plant date was row spacing. So we compared two different row spacings. We compared a traditional 30 inch row to a 20 inch row. And what we saw was on both of those different plant dates, we had a three bushel advantage to a 20 inch row over a 30 inch row. So we start thinking about some of the advantages to a narrower row, things like weed pressure, uh, sunlight capture, and different things of that nature. If we can add three bushel just by what we're narrowing up our rows, it's definitely something to consider in 2020. So at 360, we spend a lot of time talking about corn production. But for this trial, we wanted to pay a lot more attention to some of the little things we can do at little to no cost that are gonna really move the needle in those bean yields. And in 2019, we definitely picked up on some things that we're gonna try in the future and hopefully help us be more profitable for years to come.